For Kruma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, University of KZN's Associate Professor and Author Gulam Vahad, joins me to discuss his co-authored book titled Kala, Class and Community, the Natal Indian Congress, 1971-1994. to Briefly talk to us about how Indian South Africans had a proud history of resistance in the face of the white minority oppression. Indians arrived in Natal as indentured workers between 1860 and 1911. So most of them worked under a, a contract system where the conditions were very onerous. However, there is a, a history of resistance from the earlier days, from the 1860s. But if you're talking about more organized politics, then we can probably date it to the arrival of Gandhi and the formation of the Natal Indian Congress in the 1890s. And, you know, there was ongoing resistance, but the high point of that period is probably the 1913 strike, which uh, began in the coal fields and, you know, extended through to the sugar plantations and basically brought the Natal economy to a standstill. The 1930s then marks uh, another period of resistance because you had large numbers of workers in urban areas and you had the formation of trades unions as well as the Communist Party. So it was there that uh, you know, many of the young Indians became uh, involved. But where there's a sort of a very important change is in the 1940s, because you have the emergence of professionals, usually some of them trained overseas, like Dr. Monty Nyker and Dr. Gunam, and they realized that you know, uh, politics could no longer be uh, confined to memorials and to you know, just negotiations with the government, nor could it be confined to Indians. And so the two things they tried to do was to make the politics into a mass space organization and also to reach out to the ANC and to move towards a non-racial, but at the time it was called a multiracial resistance. So the 1950s then saw the defiance campaign, you had the freedom charter, and then you had this famous treason trial that lasted for five years from 1956 to 61. And so many of these Indian uh, leaders of the NIC were involved in that. And then if we move forward, the 1970s then becomes very important because you have the Durban moment, where again you have the revival of the NIC and you have uh, them involved, some members involved with the Black Consciousness Movement. And then it becomes sort of more significant in the 1980s with the formation of the UDF. So what is uh, really, I think, uh, quite important is the fact that uh, if you look at the Indian diaspora in terms of uh, the location in places like, uh, say, Kenya and Uganda and places like that, I, I, I can't think where there's such a mass involvement. Yes, there are uh, individual leaders who stand out, such as the trade unionists, uh, Maka and Singh in, in Kenya. But if you look at Africa, this is probably, you know, one example where there's such a mass-based uh, involvement of large numbers of people who, who, who reject the system. And irrespective of uh, how we would like to write history, what cannot be disputed is that over 90% of Indians rejected the government structures such as the Tricam. Talk to us more on how the revival of the Natal Indian Congress was in part a response to government's upscaling of Indian representation in apartheid structures. Okay, so to understand that, you have to understand that until 1961, Indians were regarded as the uh, a foreign element and the official policy of the nationalist government was to repatriate Indians, to send them all back to India. And in fact, from early on, they even offered... Uh, financial inducements to people to go back to India. But most of the Indians who were here regarded South Africa as their home and had refused to go back. So it was only in 1961, after South Africa becomes a republic, that the policy changes and Indians are accepted as South African citizens. So you had the formation of the Department of Indian Affairs. And with that came attempts to try to uh, create alternative structures uh, in which Indians could participate. And they did the same thing for, for colored people, and they also did the same thing for African people, where they formed a homeland, what we call Bantustan. So the idea was that you know, each of these uh, African groupings would have their own homeland, 
and uh, coloreds would have their own uh, representation and Indians would have their own representation. So you had the South African Indian Council being formed and you had LACs, local affairs committees, and certain towns like Verulam and Ispingo Beach were even granted autonomy to run the towns themselves. And also keep in mind that the 1960s were a very quiet period politically because many of the leaders were in exile or on Robben Island or banned. And then you had the, the implementation of group areas. So the mass of Indians were now moved into the townships. So all of this created a political void and it was Mewa Ram Gobin who was uh, married the uh, granddaughter of Gandhi, Ella Gandhi, who then decided that he would uh, you know, revive the Natal Indian Congress. So there was this uh, very muted political situation and it is in this context that he decided to convene some meetings and to try to revive the Natal Indian Congress. And that does take place, but uh, sadly for him, the government realized what he was doing. They actually banned him, so he could not be there at the revival of the NIC. But that was 1971. And how did the birth of the civic movement in Indian townships help improve living conditions and oppose municipal authorities by the white minority state? This is very important because the Natal Indian Congress was, you know, the leadership was mainly middle class. So the mass of Indians were actually living, if you take Durban as an example, the mass of Indians, there were 10,000 Indians living in what was known as the magazine barracks in Durban near the beach. About 100,000 were living in Cheta Manor alongside African people. So when the Group Areas Act is implemented, the government uh, build two townships. The first was Chatsworth, south of Durban, and later they would build a Phoenix, north of Durban. So suddenly people were on the move. Thousands of people were relocated possibly to these different townships. And in these townships, there were no schools, there were no sports facilities, there were no places of worship. Uh, the transportation was very rudimentary. It was difficult to get to work. The roads were poor. And as we know today with our problems with housing, you had the same problem then, where most of the houses were very poorly uh, constructed. And at the same time, the rentals kept increasing, the cost of electricity, water, all of that kept increasing. So in this context of poverty on the one hand, as well as the poor living conditions, because if you're living in a city, so as I pointed out, 10,000 people are living in the barracks, and the bread earners, they were working for the Durban municipality, and it just meant going to walk to work. But now you had to travel one hour to the city to work, one hour back, and to the high transportation costs and the people's wages were not increasing. So that is one of the features of apartheid geography, where people are always put placed very far away from their places of work. So in the different places, you had what was called housing action committees. So these were civic organizations that were formed ostensibly to improve the living conditions of the people. But, uh, you know, so the government could not ban them directly because they did not have an open political agenda because they spoke about taking up the issues of rental and, and service delivery and infrastructure, you know, basic bread and butter issues. But obviously, there was a political sort of repercussion, political implication to this, because most of these action committees then become uh, aligned to the Natal Indian Congress. And certainly in the period, say, from the very late 1970s to about 1985, their meetings would draw thousands of people because the issues were daily bread and butter issues, whether it was education, housing, sports facilities, religious facilities. Uh, you know, those kinds of issues. So I think that they did play a very pivotal role in uh, seeing to an improvement in day-to-day -to -day lives of people in a context where the government could not immediately ban them because they were not openly political. Tell us more about how those who tried to prod the NIC into dropping the eye were faced down and how BC rebels walked their own path. Okay, so this is a, a context that, you know, we just needs a background. So the Black Consciousness Movement uh, has its birth in Durban 
where Steve Biko was a student. Uh, you know, he had completed his schooling in Marion Hill, and then he was a student at the medical school. So many of the young activists of Black and Indian persuasion, uh, as well as other racial groups, they were attracted to this idea of Black consciousness, which was also very popular at the time in the US as well. You know, we, we've read Ma Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and others. And then you had rapidly many African countries becoming independent. So you had all of these influences and they resonated in Durban where the idea was that black people must liberate themselves uh, mentally uh, in, in the first instance. And so you also had this idea that you could no longer rely on white paternalism, but that you had to chart your own course. So some of the Indian, young Indian students like Sats Cooper, uh, Ashwin Trikamji, Srini Mudli, Asha Rambali, uh, Vino Reddy, and, and others, Sam Mudli, just a few that come to mind, but there were others. So they felt, they embraced this ideology of black consciousness and they rejected the idea that you can have an organization called the Natal Indian Congress. They felt that it was out of line with the then current political thinking. But the NIC activists, then they, they took a different view because they argued that, look, we are called the Natal Indian Congress simply because we are, have a history right, that goes to the 1890s. So the mass of Indian people would identify with this organization called the Natal Indian Congress, that it would be easy for us to garner political support because they could look at a history that has, uh, you know, people like Monty Naika uh, and Yusuf Dadu in the Transvaal, Dawood that Ismail Mir, all of these, uh, Dr. Gunam, all of these leaders uh, were, were still in people's consciousness and it would be easier to attract a political a, a support amongst the masses than if we suddenly called ourselves, uh, you know, the Congress or, or some other name, that people may not readily give up their support. So initially, the, the young DC activists felt that they could work from within the organization and try and change the culture of the Natal Indian Congress. But they had a number of meetings, and then they realized that the leadership of the Natal Indian Congress was wedded to this idea of retaining the name, they, even though there were very close political uh, you know, voting on, or on the name. And eventually, you could argue that... Uh, uh, they then left and they for, you know, went their own way under Biko's leadership. But uh, sadly, they did not last very long because if you recall, you had the Frelimo rally in Durban and immediately after that, most of the leadership of the Black Consciousness Movement was uh, found guilty and uh, you know, they were placed on Robben Island, jailed on Robben Island for six years, 10 years, you know, the sentences vary. So the influence of the of the black consciousness movement, I would suggest, wanes in the, within the Indian community from the time of the arrest of these young uh, political leaders. And lastly, Gulam, tell us more on why Mag Maharaj, Ahmed Katrada, and Pravin Kothan could not retreat once more in the NIC after having fought so hard to open the ANC to all racial groups. The ANC has its own uh, complex history with uh, non-racialism, right? Because if uh, um, not many people would know that. So, you know, people look at the ANC and think it's a non-racial organization. But it was actually only, in, I think, 1985 when the membership was and leadership positions were open to everybody. And so, obviously, people like, uh, uh, you know, the NIC mem members who were involved in pushing for this change. So you had MK. MK was non-racial. Its leadership was non-racial. So people like Joe Slovo and Yusuf Dado could be on that. But the others worked hard to change the ANC. And once they did that, it was a, a very uh, complex situation because somebody like Mac Maraj becomes a minister of transport. He cannot go into the uh, government as a member of the ANC. NIC, he has to go as a member of the ANC. So in the 1990s, then they had this big debate about should we retain the Natal Indian Congress or, you know, there should be no Natal Indian Congress, but all of disband the organization and all of the members join up with the ANC. 
But after some debate, they decided to allow the NIC to continue. And in fact, officially, the movement, the organization has never been disbanded. However, what happened was that part of the reason was strategic because you had a situation where the ANC needed numbers at CODESA. So the NIC and TIC and other organizations come in as separate organizations so that there were more organizations there on the side of the ANC in the, in the political discussions. So there was this complexity where on the one hand you had the ANC's own messy history with non-racialism and then it was also a case of a classic case of probably defeat in victory because the NIC members could not defend the right of the NIC to exist and yet they felt that without the NIC, they could not mobilize the Indians uh, to garner votes for the ANC. So it was a you know, chicken and egg story. And in the end, uh, the point is that their whole rationale for existing was that they wanted to use the NIC as a vehicle to mobilize Indians. But at the 1994, they could not do so because then that would have been seen as, as, as being racist. So I think that, that uh, you know, in, in, in writing this history, it's a, it was a very humbling experience for us because we knew the broad tragic, tragic tree of, of the politics. But it's only by, by writing this that we realize that the price of so many people paid in trying to achieve a non-racial uh, democracy. And sadly, not all of them are acknowledged. A few you'd find on, you know, airports and monuments and streets named after them. But the vast majority of people, you find that they were not recognized. So, you know, there's all of this uh, goes into this politics. There's also the internal fractures within the ANC, within the NIC. And these divisions, are, I think, were, uh, we tried to, sh to, to, to show. And I think perhaps that what you're seeing as a present time also is that none of these groupings are homogenous, but there are many internal fractures. So that was a conundrum that the NIC faced in 1994, that it had to, it could not exist as a racial organization. And yet its reason for existence in the first place was that it would use its racial uh, base, base in a racial community to try to garner votes for the ANC. That was Gulam Vahad speaking to Prima Media's polity about color, class and community the Natal Indian Congress, 1971 to 1994.